congratulations. So you've completed your training block. Your body has made endurance specific adaptations and race day is soon approaching. Now is the time to prepare for competition. Welcome to the second part of an endurance athlete's guide to carbohydrates. This episode will focus on carbohydrate strategies related to competing. I hope you enjoy it. In the week leading up to the race, an athlete needs to focus on getting their muscle glycogen stores optimised for race day. Without conscious consideration, you risk suboptimal stores come race day and poor performance outcomes as a result. If your muscle glycogen stores are depleted come race day, it's already too late as even with optimal carbohydrate intake and adequate rest, muscle glycogen stores replenishes only at 5 to 7% per hour. In the days leading up to the event, an athlete has the opportunity to do more than just make sure their tank is full, but they have the opportunity to trick the body into stimulating metabolic adaptations that permits the body to store more glycogen than it would usually do. This phenomenon is called glycogen supercompensation and occurs as a result of carbohydrate loading strategies. It is an endurance athlete's superpower, almost like the superhuman strength gained when Popeye eats spinach. Carbohydrate loading regimes produce a greater glycogen store which means the athlete can perform at fast pace for longer. So to recap, the goal of carbohydrate loading strategies is to maximize the density of glycogen that is stored in the muscle in preparation for race day, literally increasing the amount of glycogen available to the athlete. As mentioned in part one, An average person stores 400 grams of glycogen in skeletal muscle. Muscle cell glycogen stores are controlled at a physiological set point. This is a set point at which no more glycogen can be stored in the muscle cell and the glucose is converted to alternative metabolites and stored as fat rather than glycogen. Carbohydrate loading regimes consists of a specific sequence of events that leads to a cocktail of stimulating signals, causing the muscle cell to overcompensate with the amount of glycogen that can be stored, aka glycogen supercompensation. Usually the so-called set point of muscle glycogen storage is around 1.5 grams of glycogen per 100 grams of skeletal muscle. With carbohydrate loading strategies and associated glycogen supercompensation, glycogen concentrations can increase to around 4 to 5 grams per 100 gram skeletal muscle. That's more than double the usual amount of glycogen stores in the adapted muscle. There are several carbohydrate loading models out there, mostly varying with respect to the time taken to perform. Common features consist of a glycogen depletion phase and a loading phase. Let's take the classic carbohydrate loading model as an example. This model is a seven day regime. The aim of the depletion phase is to completely empty the muscle glycogen stores. This signals and stimulates metabolic adaptations in the muscles, which allows the process of glycogen supercompensation. 
the first step is on day one when the athlete needs to perform prolonged, exhaustive aerobic exercise that lasts at least 90 minutes of high intensity level work. It's important that the athlete does not refuel with gels or carbohydrate containing foods during the activity or after the event. A really important point is that the exercise done in the depletion phase needs to be specific to your activity. So for example, if you're going to run a marathon, then during the depletion phase, you need to be doing running as your exhaustive aerobic exercise. If you're going to do a tour, then you need to be on the bike to do it. The reasons for this is that each individual activity uses a unique combination of muscles in order for you to stimulate these metabolic adaptations that brings about glycogen supercompensation you need to lower the glycogen levels in those specific muscle groups. There's no point doing the exercise in a different activity to what you're going to be competing in because you will not bring about the metabolic adaptations needed in the specific muscle groups related to your activity. So on days two, three and four, you need to prolong the depletion phase. And this is done about by using... um, meal choices so in this particular stage you need to eat low carbohydrate foods and consume no more than 60 to 100 grams of carbohydrates per day a really important point is also that you need to maintain adequate calories in this phase depletion phase does not mean starvation or catabolic state you need to make sure that you're having adequate amounts of calories in the forms of proteins and fats. If you don't do this and you do become catabolic or basically not have enough energy to meet your requirements, your bodily functions, your body will naturally start breaking down muscle fibers in the form of breaking down proteins. This is obviously really disadvantageous to any athlete and will increase the chances of injury. This depletion phase is responsible for bringing down and maintaining low glycogen states, which induces the adaptations responsible for glycogen supercompensation. These adaptations I will discuss and the mechanisms behind them later. The exercise quantity and intensity during this period is a personal choice, but should generally be of a tapering nature. So let's now talk about the loading phase. Days five, six and seven are when the loading phase occurs. You need to consume high carbohydrate diet of 400 to 700 grams of carbs per day. The activity levels done at this point should be very light in intensity and also more towards rest. This combination of events will lead to this state of or this phenomenon of glycogen storage supercompensation and essentially tricks the body into dramatically increasing density of glycogen in the muscles for race day. So what are the muscle cellular adaptations that explain the glycogen supercompensation phenomenon brought about by carbohydrate loading? Here is a diagram of a muscle cell. You can see a GLUT4 transmembrane protein. This is responsible for moving glucose from outside the muscle cell to inside the muscle cell. Glycogen synthase is an enzyme that is responsible for converting glucose to its stored form as glycogen. 
Glycogen, like previously discussed, is a molecule which contains hundreds to thousands of glucose units all bound together. During the depletion phase, the exercise and the low carb intake results in low muscle glycogen stores. The persistent low stores stimulates a sequence of events that causes intracellular signaling, altering specific gene expression and subsequently upregulating expression of specific proteins. The exact mechanism is not fully understood. However, what is evident is that the changes lead to an increased amount of glycogen synthase levels and also an increased GLUT4 activity level. The combination of more GLUT4 transporters and higher concentrations of glycogen synthase means that when the cell is exposed to increased glucose, such as during the loading phase, more glucose enters the cell and is converted to glycogen, creating a significantly increased density of glycogen stored than otherwise would happen. So you've prepared the muscle glycogen stores in the week leading up to the race and they're bursting with glycogen waiting to be unleashed come competition. However, come race day, the preparation hasn't finished. Now it's time to get the liver stores optimised for the race. The liver glycogen stores can be depleted relatively quickly during a fasting state. Sleeping is a fasting state and the liver's role is to maintain blood sugar levels by breaking down its glycogen and releasing glucose into the blood. This means waking up from an 8 to 12 hour sleep on race day, your liver is likely to be considerably glycogen depleted and this needs to be addressed before competing. Starting a race with an already depleted liver glycogen level is really bad. Once you consume all the liver glycogen, you will develop hypoglycemia and bonk. The lower the liver glycogen levels are come the start of the race, the more likely bonking will occur during the activity. So when and how do we maximise liver glycogen stores? Well, this really depends on when your race is. Race timing will decide when you need to eat your pre-competition meals, which aim is to maximise glycogen liver stores. For example, many competitions occur in the morning. In this situation, the night before dinner and a feed three to four hours before the event are critical, whereas an afternoon race will mean the breakfast feed is even more valuable to get right. So let's talk about the pre-competition meal. The aim of the pre-comp meal is to maximise the liver glycogen stores and at the same time minimise how hard the gastrointestinal tract needs to work to obtain the carbohydrates. You don't want a meal which puts high demands on the GI tract as this will increase the risk of gastric distress and feeling of heaviness during the event. The pre-comp meal should be consumed three to four hours before undertaking physical activity. The effects of stress and anxiety of racing may mean even longer times are required to digest and absorb food. This is because the heightened state of arousal from the perceived stress stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and reduces gut blood flow impairing the GI tract's performance and resulting in longer digestion and absorption times required. The pre-comp meal should be high in carbohydrates. Aim to consume 3 to 5 grams of carbs per kilogram body mass in either solid or liquid form. So for an average 70 kilogram man, that's 210 to 350 grams of carbohydrates. 
The pre-comp meal should also avoid fats, proteins, and fiber, as consumption of these foods causes slower gastric emptying and increases the time required for the digestion and, and absorption. Consequently, the food remains in the GI tract for longer, which increases the risk of gastric distress and the feeling of heaviness when exercising. A really important point is that no food or drink should be consumed within the hour before the race. What I've just said is somewhat counterintuitive, but consuming high glycemic, rapidly absorbing carbohydrates one hour before exercise has been shown to negatively impact endurance performance. How often have you seen people on the starting line of their endurance event eating or drinking energy products just before starting their physical activity? This is a mistake and will lead to worse outcomes for these athletes. An athlete's preparation phase for energy storage should have already happened by this point, and it's already too late and indeed detrimental to start feeds now. For example, let's take the extreme scenario of an athlete consuming a highly concentrated sugary solution in the hour before the event. This will cause a rapid peak in blood glucose levels. This rapid peak stimulates insulin secretion and a relative overshoot of insulin secretion, which causes the movement of glucose into tissues and a relative drop in the blood sugar level referred to as rebound hypoglycemia. The relative lower blood sugar levels means less is supplied to the nervous system and produces a fatiguing effect. Insulin also reduces the body's ability to break down its fat stores to free fatty acids. This reduces lipid mobilization. The lower levels of fatty acids in the blood means the muscles receive less free fatty acids for use as an energy source. This effect of insulin on lipid mobilization can persist for several hours. The combination of lower blood glucose levels and lower free fatty acids supplying the muscles means the muscle has to compensate by using more of its intracellular glycogen stores to meet the energy demands of movement. This will lead to premature muscle glycogen depletion and poor performances during the activity. So to recap, the ideal pre-competition feed should be consisting of high carbohydrates and consumed at least three to four hours before the race or the event. Co-ingestion of foods containing fats, proteins or fibres should also be avoided due to the increased risk of gastric delay and gastric irritation during the exercise. And finally, as discussed, avoid consuming any food or drink in the hour preceding the race or event. Exceptions to this are sips of water, but ideally you should be well hydrated before this period anyway. Join me in part three to discuss the science behind optimum race refueling and strategies for rapid recovery.